Uh, I am Christian Vaccari. I'm the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Press Politics. I am delighted to welcome you all to the fourth day of our virtual conference and also the last day. Um, today, uh, we start with a roundtable uh, with scholars from all around the world to address uh, some very important issues that are very near and dear to the mission of the journal. I am very grateful to Anna Langer uh, and to Janice Steele for helping organizing this roundtable. And without further ado, I'm very pleased to give the floor to Janet Steele, who is a professor at George Washington University and a member of the journal's editorial board and is going to chair this session. Thank you very much, Janet, and over to you. Thank you, Christian, and good morning, everyone from the East Coast of the United States. Um, I'm just delighted to be here and to be doing this. This roundtable, the challenges of public, publishing research from and about the Global South and what we can do about it was actually Anna and Christian's idea. And I was just thrilled that you're going to do this because this has been a topic that has come up at, the, at every, uh, every one of the past conferences of the journal that I've attended. So it's just great we're doing this. Um, Anna is our, is our moderator. Uh, it, it's confusing having a chair and a moderator. My job is going to be to monitor the, the chat and uh, keep an eye on questions. And then the last 15 minutes, we'll open it up for questions from all of you. Um, Anna uh, joined the Department of Politics at the University of Glasgow in September 2006 from the London School of Economics, where she completed her doctoral studies in political communication. And her research focuses on political communication, how politics is mediated, and how this affects the conduct and nature of the democratic process. Our other panelists include uh, Tanya Bosch, who is an associate professor of media studies and production in the Center for Film and Media Studies at the University of Cape Town, where she also holds the position of Deputy Dean of Research and Postgraduate Affairs. She teaches journalism and multimedia production, social media, radio studies, and research methods at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Uh, then we have Eugenia Michelstein, who's an associate professor in the Social Sciences Department and director of the communication degree at the University of San Andres and co-director of the Center for the Study of Media and Society in Argentina. She's authored a book, a volume, and more than 20 journal articles and book chapters. And then we have Tabarez uh, Nayazi, who, who joined the Department of New Media and Political Communication at the National University of Singapore in July 2017. He's also a principal investigator at the Center for Trusted Internet and Community. And his research focuses on political communication and public opinion, computational social science, uh, communication theory, political Islam, and public policy with a focus on India, Indonesia, and South Asia. Um, and Christian Bukhari, we have already met. Uh, he joined Loughborough University in January 2018 as reader in political communication and a member of the Center for Research in Communication and Culture. And as you know, he's the editor in chief of the International Journal of Press Politics and the maestro extraordinaire of this conference. Uh, and finally, uh, my wonderful colleague, Sylvia Weisbord, director and professor in the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington. He's the author or editor of 18 books and hundreds of articles on investigative journalism, media scandals, communication studies, media policy, and global social change. And he is the former editor in chief of the International Journal of Press Politics. So it's an amazingly distinguished crowd here. I am now going to hand the microphone uh, symbolically over to Anna and uh, mute myself and keep an eye on the chat. So with no further ado, Anna, over to you. Thank you so much, Anna, for that long introduction. And I'm really looking forward to this round table. And I'm very grateful for everyone who is here, uh, the panelists and the attendees, and especially for those of you that have to wake up very early or perhaps even in the middle of the night. Uh, so I really appreciate that. I would like to give a little bit, very shortly, um, background about this round table and how it came about. As Janet mentioned, I'm originally from Argentina, but I moved to the UK more than 20 years ago. Um, my research focus migrated with me um, to the UK. So I haven't worked uh, about the Global South for quite a long time, uh, for different reasons. Sometimes I regret that, but that's a different conversation. But the fact is, I, my, my research focus is not on the global south. And yet, my interest on it hasn't weighed at all. And in fact, I think it's super fundamental for all of us. Uh, it's fundamental because although many of us based on the global north forget, um, most of the global population lives in those countries. Um, but also it's fundamental because the field is much poorer 
without those contributing. And by that, I mean the kind of the case studies uh, that are, of course, interesting, but also any kind of contributions, even if uh, only theoretically. So the field is much richer if there is more published work from and about the Global South, and also if there is more publishable work. And I think it's, you know, we need to think about both things. But as we know, that's certainly not uh, the case as much as we want. In my role as teacher, I always try to go beyond the Anglo-Saxon and beyond Europe in what I teach. And I often find it harder than I feel it should be. And as Janet mentioned, I think I heard this issue raised at the conference every year since I attended and in many other conferences. Uh, and the issue is, you know, why is there no more work about and from the Global South published in international journals? And what can we do about it? And so a couple of years ago with some colleagues here, including um, Eugenia, Silvio and Christian, we put some funding together for, for a very interesting pot of funding from the British Academy, precisely for this. Try to uh, see how we can um, enable and encourage uh, scholars from the Global South to publish in international journals. And we applied for an intensive writing and mentoring workshop in Argentina, and we failed, not once, but twice. So that is uh, what often happens. But nonetheless, along came COVID, and along came the pivot to online, and with that, Christian had the brilliant idea to, to you know, try to do part of what we were planning to do here at the conference. And there's not much I like about 2020, but I think the fact that we can all meet online internationally without additional costs of traveling or fees makes this an exceptional opportunity. And so I really uh, hope that this will be an interesting and productive conversation for us all. And I don't know who. Anna, may I may I interrupt you? I forgot to introduce Gayatri, and I'm so sorry. May I quickly introduce her now? Uh, Gayatri Venkites Warren teaches media, gender, and politics at the University of Nottingham in Malaysia, and she's published a couple of books, contributed chapters. Um, she's also an activist. Uh, her writings have mainly been geared toward public awareness and advocacy on media freedom, right to information, and digital rights, which she continues to do in addition to her academic research. My profound apologies. I'm sorry, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, Anna, but I just felt really bad. Right. I will now mute myself right. again. I sorry. Know this, but I didn't. Um, no, and I, I just yeah, concluding, um, as I was saying, I really hope this is a productive conversation, and I don't know who is present here, but I really hope our people from and um, those who work about the Global South, but also those of us who are based in the Global North, because I really hope, you know, we have a role as, you know, in boards of journals and funders, and if we are asked to review this work, we can cite it, we can teach it, and also perhaps we can have or generate mentoring uh, and co collaborations uh, with scholars from the Global South. So I, I do think that this is a conversation for all of us and for all of us to learn uh, and so in my mind, and I'm very happy to be, you know, taken in different directions. Um, I think today I'm hoping to better understand where we are at. How bad is the problem? Is it changing? And what are the causes? And what have been the experiences of our panelists about this? And finally, but crucially, what can we do about it? As a field, um, all together, right? And, and some of these might require money and we should try to get those funds, but also some of it might be more practical. And I'm hoping that we leave today's meeting with reinvigorated and refreshing ideas about what we can do structurally, but also practically to try to uh, reverse this situation. So I think that's more than enough for me for now. And um, as I think I mentioned before we started, especially for the panelists, please do feel free to come in. Um, it's weird to do this in Zoom, so you know I'm not sure I see all body language. But come in at any time you, you, you have um, something to say. And, and for now, um, Christian, as the chief editor of the journal, I know you are very aware of some of these issues and we have a lot of chats about it. And you, I know you also have compiled some data to give us a feel of how the situation is. So maybe you can show us. Thank you so much, Anna. And again, my thanks uh, for organizing this. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, in preparation for this meeting, I have asked Sage, uh, who very kindly uh, accepted my request, to provide some data on um, where 
the authors come from of the articles we receive and of the articles that we publish. Um, but before I show you these data, I will show you some other uh, slightly different data. Um, these come from a, an, a forthcoming uh, article in uh, political communication, which has a section called the forum, uh, which is dedicated to, you know, live ongoing discussions about both the discipline and, you know, issues like public engagement, for example, or specific methodological issues. Uh, and as part of this uh, section, um, Eric Busey and Heather uh, Evans um, have provided an analysis of the past 20 years worth of publications in political communication and IJPP. And they've kindly accepted to make uh, their data available to me. I've augmented their data. They've basically taken a random issue for every year uh, of these two journals from 1996 until, I think they did until 2016. And then I augmented the data to go through until 2020. Uh, I'm, only going to I'm only showing you here data for IJPP. The data for political communication, as far as I could tell from their article, uh, is very similar with perhaps a little less uh, uh, internationalization than we're going to show here. So this map here shows you uh, what IJPP, pub, well, a random sample of IJPP articles from 1996 until 2009. 1996 is when the journal was founded. Um, so it's a sample of 71 articles uh, published over uh, 14 years. Um, and basically, you know, the, the darker the green in the map, uh, the higher the number of articles focusing on that country. So here, the, 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 the uh, content of the map represents which articles, uh, uh, which country the articles focuses on, not where the authors come from. The data I'm going to show you later uh, pertain to where the lead author of the article come from. So this is really the, 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 the best representation of where our knowledge uh, is and where our knowledge lags, uh, at least if measured through articles published in IJPP. So as you can see here, you know, uh, up until 10 years ago, we were pretty much, you know, a journal publishing mostly uh, about the United States with some very, very light tinges of color in, you know, basically uh, outer Western democracies uh, and Russia, uh, really, uh, and, and a bit of green if you can see it in South Africa too. Uh, but mostly uh, this was a journal about liberal democracies uh, for lack uh, of a better term. And back in the day, maybe Russia, you know, people hoped was becoming a functioning liberal democracy. Uh, fast forward 10 years and the map is a bit more colorful. Um, we have been publishing uh, quite a bit more on, uh, you know, the so-called global, global South, which is obviously a shorthand that has its problems, but, you know, I thought we could use it at least to give us a, a pointer. Uh, so our knowledge has become a bit more inclusive. It's still very much uh, centered on the US and to a, uh, a lesser degree, the UK. Um, the, the colors of the map correlate pretty well with uh, things like you know, GDP, income, uh, amount of money that a country spends in research and development, you know, all these things that we know affect uh, the way higher education works, the way, you know, publicly funded research works in particular. But it's become a more inclusive uh, map, but still a map that is dominated by, uh, you know, the usual suspects that, you know, are also the countries where, uh, you know, the leading theories in our field come from, uh, the most cited works in our field come from, and so, so on and so forth. Uh, so this is, I think, you know, a useful representation, I hope, is a useful representation of you know, the, the, the map of knowledge that we have, and obviously the, uh, you know, areas colored in, in, in light green or white, you know, basically show where we lack knowledge. And uh, th these are pretty big splotches, you know, and, and a lot of people live in countries where uh, we don't have a lot of research in political communication or, you know, broadly in the relationship between the press and politics, which is what the journal focuses on. So I'm now going to show you some uh, similar, but not, not entirely similar data, uh, which uh, in this case uh, pertain to where uh, the lead author resided when they submitted an article to, to the journal, which is the data that Sage has made available to me. And it's uh, instead of being based on random samples of articles in the journal, it's based on every single article that was submitted in the journal from 2007 until uh, August 2020, right? So uh, not, not of course, the whole uh, of 2020, but pretty close. So here, uh, 
I've used different colors, but the logic is the same. Um, and you can see the raw numbers, well, some of the raw numbers uh, in uh, the chart in the table to the right. So the dominance of American submissions, at least, these are articles that get submitted to the journal, uh, is even more pronounced uh, if you look at uh, uh, this map, if you look at who submits. Uh, roughly one third of the articles that we receive in the last uh, 13 and a half years comes from the US. Uh, roughly 10% come from the UK. Uh, and then you have uh, all the other countries that you can see here in the list, and most of them are Western democracies. Uh, for the purposes of uh, illustration, I've kept China and Hong Kong separated in the table, uh, in the map, uh, because I'm not skillful enough to uh, draw out these differences. They are combined uh, uh, in, in, the, in the representation of China. Uh, but as you can see, most of the articles we receive come from democratic regimes uh, in the global north, in the west, call it what you want. Uh, and this is what my, you know, when I spoke to Rasmus Klees Nielsen, who is the editor that uh, uh, had this job before me, uh, that's one of the first things he told me, uh, that we have these structural uh, issues in the, uh, uh, where the articles that we receive come from. Uh, that an editor can do very little about. You know, I can only publish what I receive. Uh, I can obviously solicit contributions. I can obviously reach out to people. And I hope that this conference has been uh, useful to introduce uh, some colleagues in the Global South to the journal and to the kind of work we uh, promote and we want to publish. But when it comes to what we receive, the picture is pretty clear. Uh, and it's a pretty lopsided picture. Um, when it comes to what we accept, the map is not dramatically different. Uh, we accept uh, the country from which we publish most is still, the, the three countries from which we publish most are still the US, the UK, and Germany. Um, and we don't publish many articles from authors residing in countries in the Global South, uh, as you can see. And again, somebody could do research on the Global South while residing in an institution in the Global North, of course, so this is only partial. Uh, but to the extent that you know, the funders in most countries prioritize research in that country or researching political regimes that are similar to that country, uh, to the extent that the incentives lie uh, in prioritizing work that speaks to the problems of your own political systems. And you know, God knows whether the US and the UK you know, don't have problems in their political systems that require in-depth innovative research to inform better policies and better behavior by elites and citizens. But, you know, to the extent that these things happen, uh, we, uh, we see that, you know, our acceptance patterns are not dramatically different from the, 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 the submission patterns. Uh, they're, they're slightly different. You know, the, the colors in this map for the Global South are, are slightly, um, are slightly um, more faint. Uh, so we publish less than we receive. Uh, but broadly, the, the, the inequalities that drive the knowledge that we can make available to, to the public are driven by what we receive via submissions. Um, this other map, and I'm sorry if I'm confusing it with all these maps, but you know, I find them interesting and, and frankly fun to draw. Um, this shows you the acceptance rate uh, for all the countries from which we receive manuscripts. Um, and as you can see, you know, the US actually has a lower acceptance rate than most other countries. Uh, the average acceptance rate throughout the last 13 and a half years has been 18%. So we accept 18 for every 100 manuscripts we receive. Um, and as you can see, the countries that are, you know, again, Western democracies are the ones that have the highest acceptance rates. Um, paradoxically, the US has a, uh, an acceptance rate that is just as the average, right? So, uh, and that's a function of the fact that, of course, there are lots of great PhD programs in the US and great research institutions that generate a lot of research, but some of it uh, doesn't quite make it. Um, but, you know, for example, you know, I'm Italian, you know, uh, uh, Italy does, does quite well in terms of percentage of, uh, of acceptance. Um, and, and, and that is not something that, you know, many Italian academics would probably uh, have thought. Uh, and I'd be curious to see if any, any fellow Italians are here and what they think about these data. But basically, you know, all the countries that have higher than average acceptance rates, acceptance rates apart from Kenya, uh, are Western liberal democracies. But this is pretty much the case also when it comes to submission. And so 
my final uh, slide, and this is not a map, but it's a scatter plot. I've plotted uh, how many manuscripts we receive on the x axis, on the horizontal axis, and the acceptance rate and the acceptance rate on the vertical axis. And as you can see, you know there are lots of countries with you know zero acceptance rate, uh, but by and large, the more manuscripts we receive from one country, the higher the likelihood that manuscripts from that country get accepted. So there is a, a supply-driven effect here, I think, you know, an economist would call it. And, you know, the correlation is, is pretty strong. And, I, you know, I've prepared these figures in the past few days, and I didn't expect this to be uh, so strikingly the case. Um, and so I hope this has, you know, provided some fruit for thought in terms of thinking about uh, not only what we can do as scholars when we review, when we join editorial boards, when we, you know, edit journals, when we start new journals, uh, when we criticize journals, uh, but also as members of, you know, uh, academic communities, policymaking communities, uh, and, and international organizations, uh, what we need to address is not only what happens, you know, uh, downstream when a manuscript gets submitted, uh, but also upstream when you know, a manuscript does or doesn't get written uh, in the first place, uh, and when it gets written, when, you know, the authors think that it could go into an international journal such as ours, as opposed to, you know, other outlets where, you know, for better or worse, they'll have, you know, different degrees of visibility and a different level of impact on international research. Um, that's all from me from now, and I look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Christian. That's super useful. And it's interesting. I, I wouldn't have thought that it was so much a problem of supply, um, as you said, and maybe something we can we can pick up on later. Silvio Weisberg, maybe you can Silvio, you were chief uh, editor of not one but two of the journals in the field. Um, so you know the picture well as well. Can you maybe add something to to the picture that Christian presented? Of yeah, I will be I will be happy to do it. So uh, just to be quick. So yes, I was the editor in chief of um, International Journal of Press and Politics, uh, two thousand eight until twenty fourteen, if I'm if I'm correct. And then I was the editor in chief of the Journal of Communication. And of course, the data uh, was pretty similar to what Christian just, just showed. Uh, this is well documented. Uh, and in fact, there are some journals that actually do better, but still the, the structural uh, differences are the same. And the problem is, from an editor's perspective, is what Christian mentioned, which is you are at the end of a process of structural inequalities. So what you receive is the product of huge disparities, not in terms uh, in terms of how much money is spent on research at the at the country level and the regional level. What is the size of the pool of um, academics? How many people work in a given country in questions related to news and politics or communication uh, in general? Um, third, the fact that these journals, like most sort of um, Top rank journals tend to be tend to be based in the in 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 the West, in the U.S. and in a few European countries. So it makes sense that sort of they try to draw from the pool of the countries where this where these countries originally come from. Um, also, is the power of the networks that the professional networks that these journals draw from are primarily professional networks of people uh, based in this in these countries. Uh, also, is the matter of language. That is uh, the question of you need to master academic English um, in order to publish in these and other journals that are top ranked in the field. Uh, also, that the patterns of what is academic excellence are grounded in academic cultures on both sides of the North Atlantic primarily. So, once you start breaking down the process, there are so many reasons why these numbers. Uh, look the way that Christian just just told us, and in some ways, without addressing some of these uh, structural uh, inequalities, it's very difficult to make a dent, is to make a difference. As an editor, you can do certain things in order to basically uh, tame the tie, basically, but is but it's very limited, and we can talk about that. 
Uh, but I think that it's important to focus on what we can do rather than only on what are the problems. Um, so I want to be aware of that there is something that we can do, but there are some uh, fundamental difficulties that are much more challenging because of huge inequalities in terms of higher education systems around the world and the origin of these journals that are um, top ranked around the world. Give you that's super helpful uh, and yeah and, and uh, again I think we can go back to that um, to, to discuss what can we do um, both in the practical level but also in the, in the more structural level. Uh, it would be great to hear from some of you I mean any of our panelists about your personal experiences in terms of the challenges of publishing and, and you are all very successful also so it would be great if you if you can comment on, on, on the challenges to do so and also as a mentor of other scholars in, in the country for your race. Eugenia? Yes, so I first of all I wanna note that there has been some change in this is the last I'd say five years that when I started submitting uh, manuscripts to journals that were mostly about Argentina, I always got the same uh, comment from reviewer two mostly, which is how is this relevant to the rest of the world? Uh, which is never asked about papers about the United States or the United Kingdom. So, and I'm getting less of that, a little bit less of that, which I think is, is great news. I, it might also have to do with the fact that not only myself, but other authors are preempting this kind of criticism. So we, we put in the paper, like before we start, why that is relevant to the rest of the world or how, how does it compare to the rest of the world. But I've seen some change in this. But I'd like to uh, talk about an experience I had as an, as an invited editor, associate editor, as a journal, I won't say which. Uh, this is not about a paper of mine. It's about a, a paper from somebody else from another country in Latin America. And uh, the reviewers had some comments. The, the editor was mostly great about it. But then when, when, the edit, when the reviewers were done and they said accept, the editor was like, you need, the, the author needs to put at every point that this is from this particular country with this particular student sample. And I'm like, no, because there are lots of papers with student samples from the United States and authors are not made to point out at every paragraph that this is from a country with a student sample. So this doesn't make any sense. And there was a very tough discussion to have because we tend to accept that papers with student samples from the US, mostly like a large Midwestern research university uh, are okay. But when somebody tries to do that, uh, I, in any other country from Latin America or from Africa or from Asia, we're like, this, this should be noted that this is a student sample. So I think that what we need to work in is um, both as editors and as authors and also as associate editors and as invited editors and as reviewers is to have the same standards, not different standards, the same standards to apply to research in, I'd say, the global north to the global south. So that's, that's something I noted. I noted it's changing slowly, but I like to see less of the, you need to know that this is from a country, a sample in a country and just say, okay, you say it in the, like in the introduction, you say it in the methods and then the reader knows what it's about. So it's not, uh, so that was my experience and I hope we see less of that in, in the future. Um, and I, and I also like to like to say that, of course, this make, gets better if, if in your papers you say from the beginning why, why that is relevant. I'd like to make like a different point and then I, I leave the mic to somebody else, which is that um, somebody asked in the comments uh, if we're building theory. And it's interesting that what's happening right now in the United States, and I'm, I'm not an expert on US politics or US communication, so I, I won't talk about it, but this polarization, uh, doubts about the elections, has already happened in many countries in Latin America. So maybe some of the things we are learning, and not only in Latin America, which is what I'm kind of an expert on, but probably in other countries in Africa and in Asia. So what we are seeing right now in the United States as, uh, as scholars, as researchers, might be informed by what we know has happened in the Global South. Not that it is the same, of course it is not the same, there are different processes, there's a whole ethnic race issue that's not the same in other countries. But I definitely think that uh, about the question of building theory, yes, 
I think research in the United States right now might be informed by processes in other countries. So that's, that's my take. Great, thank you, Eugenia. And I, and I see in the comments, I think Patricia Rossini was making a similar case uh, about the importance of using the same standards and not expecting different or more certification of, of what we do when it's uh, from or about the Global South. And what about, um, Tanya, the, what have you been your experiences, for instance, on trying to, to publish in international journals? Um, yeah, be before I answer that, I think I just want to e echo Eugenia's comments about um, research from the so-called global south being considered as area studies and always having to make the case for how does this, how is this relevant to a broader international context, um, you know, when that, that is not always the case for, for scholars um, in other parts of the world. But so, so before I answer the question about specific challenges, um, maybe just to say that it may seem like an obvious answer, but I think in some ways we need to almost take a step backwards and ask the question, what does the journal gain from expanding geographic representation from contributing authors from different countries? Because I think, um, you know, th this will really help us us make, make a shift. And I think Christian's comment sort of hints at this. There's a difference between content um, and a kind of political perspective. So we find ourselves in a kind of current political moment of decolonization. Um, and there's a comment in the chat that talks about to what extent are papers from the South validate, validating theory developed in the North, um, or are they building new theory from the South? So I think that's the that's quite a key question because for me it's more it it, it has to be more about um shifting perspective than just geographic representation so i think we, we need to ask the question what do we gain from expanding geographic representation and in some ways i think the answer is that we want to um, have broader perspectives because it's not just about having contributors from different countries or from countries in the global south but we also want to shift um, the kind of perspective, the frameworks um, with which we look at things to, to have a true kind of um, shift shift in perspective, build new theory, um, um, et cetera. Um, and then I think just in terms of, you know, your, your question around challenges, um, I think that there are a number of issues that, that are related to this. I think, um, you know, I'm very fortunate to have, be one of the uh, Global South scholars that has published in the, in the journal, so I can speak very much from pers personal experience. Um, and one of the key things I think for me as an African scholar is that um, our media studies tradition um, are very, very located in a cultural studies framework, often um, hugely qualitative kind of cultural studies framework, whereas it was a big kind of cultural shift, you know, um, for us when we published in the journal because we had to frame our work much more in a social science, political science um, kind of perspective. So I think that's one thing to note is that many scholars in media studies communication, broadly speaking, um, in Africa or in South Africa at least, um, come, come from a kind of slightly different, more humanities and less social science, more qualitative, less, less quant, um, more, more sort of cultural studies. And so we do different kinds of research and that's probably why you haven't seen so many articles coming from, coming from this context. Um, I think um, this is a challenge, you know, I also happen to be an associate editor of a local journal, African Journalism Studies, AJS, um, and I think a big difficulty for many people is the that there isn't a quick turnaround in terms of reviews. So from first submission to publication um, often takes a very, very, very long time, and so people often prefer to just, you know, um, submit work to local to local journals where they can publish quicker um, sometimes instead of going through a lengthy process of a revise and resubmit with a journal like IJPP and then the revise and submit in the end um, may not actually be accepted. So I think time timelines and, and this is a challenge for all journals. We struggle with AJ, at AJS as well to get stuff out quickly because reviewers are becoming, it, it's becoming more and more difficult to get people to actually review articles and to write good reviews reviews. Um, so one solution I think is that the editor, and this, this will be my final comment, I apologize, I've already talked for too long, but I think um, the key is really having editorial board, having diversity in terms of your editorial board members um, so that you can have the kind of diversity in submissions and editorial board members need to be actively involved in things like edit, uh, edit, editing special issues, for example, but also doing reviews so that you can have quick, quick turnaround times 
um, and specialized knowledge from the editorial board specifically. Um, it's important not to ghettoize issues with regard to the global south, so you don't necessarily want special issues that are um, geographic specific. Um, but I think that having editorial, having diversity in terms of your editorial board members, and this is something that other international journals have started to do. So ICS, for example, has an, I'm, I'm the African editor of ICS, and that's been quite interesting um, because I then review lots of submissions from, you know, the, my geographic area, and I'm involved in um, sp with special issues, and I kind of, as an African editor, give perspective, give a different perspective when it comes to um, kind of designing the you know, what the journal will look like in, in the years ahead. And um, so that's one particular, um, you know, uh, solution, I think. But I think the question, I mean, I think um, we, we kind of have to take a few steps back and Christian, maybe you can answer that um, or, or maybe others need to answer that. And the, the question isn't necessarily that, I mean, the answer isn't necessarily that obvious, but the question is really what what is it that the journal hopes to gain or what will it gain from expanding um, this kind of ge geographic representation so that it's not a kind of tick box affirmative action you know tick box exercise for diversity on the face of it it, it has to be a broader exercise thanks colleagues thank you so much tanya that that's great that's very helpful christian do you want to comment on that uh, very, very briefly to say that, yes, I, I, I very much agree uh, that, you know, if it's just a matter of coloring a map, I mean, obviously I've shown you color maps, but if it's a matter of coloring the map, uh, Italians would say, you know, planting little flags, um, then it's, uh, it's window dressing, it's, it's box ticking, and uh, it won't be very helpful. Um, it, it has to be about broadening, broadening our knowledge, and it has to be about broadening the sources of our knowledge in terms of theories, in terms of how we understand the world, in terms of methods. Um, and that is where it gets difficult. And I mean, without wanting to take up too much time as a, you know, PhD student and as a, you know, early career scholars, you know, I would start every single paper I would write, especially for international journals with the, uh, you know, by repeating the assumption that political communication serves democracy. And that the reason why it is important to study journalism, internet websites of political parties, social media, was to do with the fact that these are channels that are part of mechanisms that make democracy work. Uh, and over the past few years, I've been wondering how do we, you know, how how do we still rely on these theories when those assumptions are probably no longer true in many countries where you know, some of these uh, mechanisms have been broken. Uh, some of mechanisms of political communication do not go in that, in that direction. Um, and where probably, as, as, as Eugenia was saying earlier, you know, we, we have more to learn about, uh, uh, about some countries in the West, at least, that are, that are undergoing different forms of democratic backsliding and how political communication contributes to that from studies of, of, of similar countries in, you know, Latin America or, or elsewhere. Uh, that have already gone through these processes. Uh, but to do that, we need to rethink some of those basic assumptions that, that my, old, my younger self would always start his papers from. And, and that, is, that is difficult, but I think that has to be the goal. And that is why you know, I think that it's, it's important to broaden that diversity, not only to color the map, but to change the way our knowledge is produced and the way we set out to prepare to, to produce these studies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tavaris, did you want to come in? Um, so I think um, we have a lot of very interesting points here. And uh, personally, I have both uh, positive experience and negative experience, which I would like to explain. But uh, before going in there, what we recognize here first is that there is certain kind of institutionalized networks of power in the process of knowledge production in global academia. That is um, what has been already emphasized. And the second, which is also very important point that has been also emphasized here is the need to create diversity in the production and circulation of academic knowledge. And that is very important. 
But then the third point that we have to think about whether the intervention should be institutionalized or individualized, or in other words, should we aim for some kind of institutionalized intervention by setting certain criteria or should it be just voluntary intervention? So before going in there into detail, I would like to uh, also, I really agree with the point that uh, Patricia made and then uh, in the comment section and then the Eugene made. And so what happens, there is certain kind of inherent bias when we, is, uh, when reviewers start reviewing um, manuscript from Global South and that I have faced quite often. So if the findings from the Global South challenges the existing theories, it is often seen with certain degree of skepticism. So uh, I don't know how many times any manuscript has been sent to six reviewers. Anyone has experienced this? And I'm not talking about top journal, not talking about top 5% journal. And if you look at, uh, uh, if someone, uh, if any of uh, you are interested to discuss more later, we can discuss. If you look at the comments of the first four reviewers, three were positive, one wanted it to be rejected. So I'm not so sure why it was said, uh, sent to six, but I would definitely like to get some of your opinion or your experience. If ever any manuscript has been sent to six reviewer in the very first instant. It's not like uh, um, after you have sent it to three and then another three. So that is one point that I would like to raise here. So when we talk about uh, some uh, inherent biases, this is very important to understand that there is certain kind of in inherent biases when the existing or when your research challenges the existing theories. So, so that's, uh, 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 that's a, uh, one point. So the second other, so it's not just a structural problem or the fundamental problem that we have been discussing, but the problem is also, the problem also lies somewhere else and that we have to also think about. The second other, uh, important point I would like to raise here is about empirical versus theoretical research. So if there are manuscript which is being submitted from the global south, which is basically bringing a kind of new empirical evidence to show how there is some kind of important transformations in the media, in the particularly the internet uh, and the digital media environment, should it be um, considered for publication or should it be sent back because it does not make any kind of new theoretical intervention. And every uh, journal has different criteria, different standard, and it also depends upon who the reviewers are. But then if you look at the initial publications it, with regard to digital media, internet, even media, uh, if, if you go back to 80s and uh, then you will see a lot of res empirical research on television. But then if the similar kind of empirical research is being submitted from the global south, it was immediately rejected because of, for the reason that it does not make any kind of theoretical contribution. But this, uh, this call has to be, editors call what, um, how they want to bring diversity. So that's where, I would like to end here by uh, making one point. So whether we are going to set certain kind of goals, so how to bring more diversities and whether we can take some kind of concrete measures. So, and whether uh, um, the, and can we, uh, can we really set some kind of uh, concrete goals which can address the structural problem as well as the problem which we often see when the reviewers has certain kind of inherent biases when they review the manuscript from the global south. So I will stop here. Right, thank you, so uh, I mean, a lot of emphasis on the role of reviewers, I think, and editors uh, here 
uh, which is important and, and I think perhaps something that it can be addressed and as Eugenia was saying, it's perhaps improving slowly and uh, in part because I think a lot of people have been working on trying to um, make a point about this publicly um, and I think perhaps social media has helped on this somewhat uh, but also yeah I think there needs to be more work perhaps from editors and reviewers to, to educate themselves so to speak. Sorry about the ambulance. Um, one point that I, I can't really look at the chat in detail but I can see there is a lot of conversation among scholars based on the global south aware of these inequalities but also the question of whether people based on the global north are equally aware um, of this and I, I don't know I mean perhaps uh, Silvio you are based at the, at the top of the global north um, in an institution at the in Washington so it's at the core of that uh, do you think your colleagues uh, who don't work on, on these uh, countries and don't come from those countries are aware of this or um, would so be surprised by the conversation? Um, okay, so I, in my mind, the point is this. So uh, let me try this way of answering your, your question, Anna. Um, I think that we have made a lot of progress on this in terms of raising awareness and diversifying the pull of submissions to uh, journals and panels and editorial boards. There is no question that when I started 30 years ago, someone originally from Argentina moved to the US to do a PhD in, in sociology. 30 years ago, the situation was very, very different. Uh, at ICA, for example, it was very difficult for me to find a home. At AJ, it was almost impossible. Very few people working on issues outside of the US or a few European countries. The challenge that we have now is the following. It seems to me that this is a conversation that we tend to have among people who believe that this is a problem and something needs to be done. And I will not be surprised if the people who are in this panel, in this conversation right now, 80 of us, are either people who work on the Global South, people originally from the Global South, or people who have been working in networks of researchers in the Global South. That has been the pattern for too long. And I still find it remarkable, the lack of curiosity, of interest in people outside of this community that we belong to in this issue. As if this were an issue of a bunch of specialists, as if this were an issue that only affects specialists who care about, let's say, any communication, news, or political issue in the Global South. This is an epistemological problem. It's about how we produce knowledge how we produce theory, what is the reach and the scope, what is the validity of arguments primarily grounded in databases and findings from a small number of countries. That to me is the problem. That is to me is the next challenge. How we raise awareness and engage people who believe that this is not something that they have anything to do with it. And that is a challenge. And let me finish this with an anecdote. When I was writing my dissertation, which was about sort of the, meditation, the mediatization of politics in Argentina in the 80s and the transition to democracy. I wrote my thesis at a Center for Latin American Studies at Notre Dame University. And the director was a well-known political scientist, uh, Guillermo Donnell, a towering figure in studies of democratization. So he asked me, who are you writing this for? And I said, well, originally I thought about writing it for Latin American is because I thought about staying in the US as a Latin Americanist. And then I realized there are no jobs for Latin Americans anymore. That was sort of the end of the Cold War. And I said, well, probably I, it will make more sense for me to get a job in the journalism department or communication department. So he said, are you writing this for American scholars who work in political communication? Yes. And why do you think that they will pay attention to you? Why do you think they will read your work? I've been finding that, he tells me, for decades. It's very, very difficult to make an argument that is theoretically grounded, that is grounded on, on evidence about people who, for the most part, don't have an interest or curiosity or belief that has anything to do with the work that they do. And it seems to me that that is still the challenge that we all face. It's import as important as it is to talk among us, it is important to include, to engage people who are sort of, sort of what are the blind spots in our field? And that's what we have to go for. Otherwise, what we're doing is extremely important and makes me very happy compared to what the solution was three, three decades ago, but we need to do more. Thank you.
May I jump in now, Anna? Um, I think that was a very, um, yeah, I, I feel it was very appropriate for me to come in at this point. So um, quite different from the experiences of everyone else who's spoken with your vast experience in academia. Um, uh, I've come into this um, space uh, recently, just a, a few years, because I've spent the most of my last 20 years um, in journalism and also in activism. Um, and I've been writing for change, uh, which uh, we hope that a lot of the scholarly work also is uh, uh, going towards. Um, so my experience has a lot been with writing um, primarily for the purposes of advocacy, policy change, uh, public awareness. Yeah. So I think when Silvia said, you know, who do you actually really write for, um, whether it's scholarly work or other, other types of work, I think sometimes we also need to just um, maybe be reflective of that also. Um, I think for me, uh, observing just within this, um, I won't speak for the region, even though I have very close friends and, and a lot of associates within uh, Southeast Asia and, and Asia. Um, I think we do still have this challenge that we are, unfortunately, our knowledge is mediatized by, you know, the platforms that exist elsewhere. And, and you know, this is an issue that was raised many, many, many decades ago, and yet we are still doing this in which we want to talk to each other, but we are talking to each other through, you know, this, this um, maybe spaces that are not really invested uh, or platforms that are invested in uh, the issues, although that, that's definitely changed. But I think in my, in my experience writing both as an activist and now slowly starting a bit more in the academic field is that there's actually quite a rich, um, um, I think a, a rich um, offering, um, especially in Asia um, for, for journals or, or publications that actually bring together academics and civil society writers. And I think that's where I actually got my footing in, which is, writing or, or doing research um, in a semi-scholarly way, but more really in the language of um, activism and, and writing for that change. And I think that's actually quite a, a useful platform because we are talking to, uh, uh, I suppose, stakeholders or those who are interested in, um, you know, in, in communicating about that change, right? Um, so I think just, just to put out there that, that there is actually quite a, a rich um, offering, but I think for a lot of academics, especially in this region as well, you know, in order to go forward in their field, in our field, um, you cannot escape the fact that when it comes to assessing your credibility, your integrity, you're, you're assessed against the kinds of standards that are set by the kind of international uh, journals and, and publications. So in the social sciences, in the field of, um, um, for example, in, in media, within our universities, um, it's still, a, it's still expected that you must publish in the number of journals uh, of, of certain background rather than other kinds of publications. So that, that problem is still there. And so a lot of scholars actually try to aim for that maybe less successfully than, you know, as we see in the map uh, that you presented, Christian. Um, but it then I, I feel that it sort of draws the attention away from uh, being able to communicate more effectively towards or, or to, to audiences that would really um, also use that information. Um, and, and taking away maybe resources that have maybe been invested in some of the other publications. I mean, you know, as, as a way of allowing for a lot more knowledge to be created and disseminated within these regions. So there's a challenge inherently in the institutions here that still uh, demand, I think, for a certain kind of recognition. And that recognition comes from General A, General B, General C, you know, very specifically in those areas. And that when it comes from other sources, other kinds of journals, then it's not given the due recognition, even though the quality of the work and what is being uh, um, discussed in there is, is of, um, you know, I, I think it's actually quite uh, worthwhile. So that's just my initial observation and really, you know, just coming to this field um, very new, uh, but having a little bit more experience when it comes to doing work for uh, social change. Um, and I think also sometimes we are divided, our hands are a little bit divided because we want to publish and, and reach out to everyone else in this field, everywhere in the world. And then at the same time doing a, a firefighting at home when we also act as activists. Yeah? So we're also constantly actually writing and, and, and advocating at the local level. Um, and at the same time having to do this kind of uh, research that 
meets those international standards. Um, and, and, and actually, I mean, we should have those standards. So that's a kind of a battle also, I think, for some of us, uh, um, having to meet those uh, expectations. But I just wanted to share that just to, you know, um, you know talk about, you know, some things that do exist, but are not really given the kind of, um, uh, not, the, not in the spotlight per se, because partly they're also not in the English language. And, and that alone excludes them from the kind of appreciation, I think, and the recognition. Yeah. Thank you, Gayatri. That, that's um, great. And I think, yeah, it speaks to, to Sylvia's point about what, what is knowledge and, you know, whether we really, what we need is to, to expand that, that sense. Um, and also in terms of the, the, the conversation, I mean, how, how do we, to, to, to your point, um, how do we expand this conversation beyond those who for some reason apparently do happen to have the curiosity? Because uh, I think what we, we see in the discussion is that's key, right? I mean, in terms of the, the, the practical steps and the more structural steps is to expand um, those who, who um, are interested um, and understand that th this is important and it's not just about the, the patterns uh, of the global north and, and, and the global south trying to replicate that um, in the same way. Eugenia, yes. Yes, um, I, I agree with what all my co-panelists have said and, and I, have, I have a suggestion that might, might not seem, I'd say, I would say simpatica in Spanish. I don't know the exact word in, in English to that, which is not sympathetic, that's something else. But it, it which is, I understand uh, that we live in, in a world of uh, structural differences from the beginning, from the way universities allocate funds in the Global North and in the Global South, and, and who gets to be the editor and reviewer and everything. But I think there are some things we could do in the Global South to actually, um, try to get people more interested or more curious in what we do. And I, I have, I'd like to suggest that people who have uh, lived or, or studied in the Global North, at least for a while, I came back to the Global South, so it's, I'm not there anymore. I'm not, I'm not in the Global North anymore, um, is to act as bridges, we might say. So if we identify a student or a, 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 a scholar who's beginning her PhD or who's, actually finishing her dissertation. And, and I, I've read some comments out how Brazil's um, scientific system doesn't recognize global uh, journals any, as, as any better or even as equals of Brazilian journals. And, and, and some of that happens in Argentina too, but maybe encourage them to write an article, not their whole dissertation as a book, but an article for a global journal or for, for an international journal in English. And, and give them some tips on that. And, and editing their academic English, which might not be uh, at, at the level of an international journal, but act as like, it's not, I know editing isn't fun, so I can tell that as a professor, but I think it's an important job to do and say, listen, I love your arguments, I love your research, I love what you're doing, this is very interesting, but it will, it will get more chances to be published if you phrase it this way. If you, I, so this is not, this is not fun work. And sometimes you feel like you're conforming to the norms of a different culture, as anthropologists would say. But sometimes conforming to the norms of a different culture is, is a way to begin dialogue. So I say, um, this is, this doesn't cost, it costs time, but it doesn't cost money. And in, in my experience, it's very rewarding to see uh, graduate students or, or, or even undergraduate students get their, you know, junior dissertation or senior dissertations published um, uh, and see, oh, look, my work can have like, uh, I don't know, top uh, world, uh, world level, uh, I would say, standards. It can meet these standards. So I'd say this is something we can do, uh, like in the scholars who belong a little bit to the Global North, but mostly to the Global South, as I feel I belong. So this is something, and, and I know it's, it's not nice to say this, like it's not, but I say we, we can work with this. This is just a, an idea I have. Great, thank you. And I think, I mean, probably people based on the Global North that, 
um, have the, the interest and the curiosity can also play that role in bridging. Um, I think Silvia mentioned in one of the first uh, remarks the importance of networks. So I think anything that can, can help to develop networks where you know, these scholars come together rather than separately um, are going to be uh, very important. Any, any, yeah, yep. Gayatri? Just quickly, yeah, is I collaboration an overused yeah. word? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, just uh, is collaboration an overused terminology that we are a bit tired of listening to because that's, I suppose, uh, a way also of um, maybe bridging that. Uh, not, not a gap per se, but I suppose that, that area of interest and, and commitment, right? And, and to say, to get people to be more invested in the issues across, um, uh, to raise that interest level as well. Um, so I work specifically on the area of media, um, uh, media advocacy, media freedom, uh, reform. And actually in this region, I'm, I'm located in Southeast Asia. Um, I, and I think also like in many parts of the, the world, um, there's so much of literal investment when it comes to money in terms of media development and media reform that it has to make sense, right? To, to, to want to know um, and to want to get that kind of empirical data. And actually as um, you know, uh, Tiberius mentioned, also to, 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 to think back about some of the theoretical foundations that were there decades ago you know um, it, it's too bad that we are still within that framework uh, often but the empirical data actually enriches some of those uh, observations but the fact that there's so much of resources invested really in the field of media especially in countries that are you know going through these transitions i think should really warrant that kind of um, um, intellectual investment as well right from those um, you would say scholars from the north for example so just thinking collaboration, maybe an overused terminology, but probably still relevant in this uh, context. Uh, Tavaris, did I interrupt you? Yeah, so I'm going to make a different point because recently one of the editors of a journal reached out to me to find out why there are very few submissions from India. So, and then, so here also, I would like to point out there is also a structural problem within the country. So there is no incentives to publish in a top journal. So a lot of there are in-house journals in, within the country and a lot of scholars, they are publishing in those journals. So for example, one of the important journals in India is Economic and Political Weekly. So which is called weekly, but it has published a very important some it has made a very important contributions to to the overall field of social science so and a lot of scholars publish in there so what happens in india for example even if uh, you try to bring more diversities uh, in um, so, uh, sorry so the point i'm trying to make here is that it's very difficult to incentivize the scholars based in india to publish in top journals, only those who are motivated, they would submit those uh, articles to an uh, international journal, which is based outside of India. And here, what is also happening is that some of these publications, if you look at, it is really, it could go to any top journal. It's very well, theoretically, very polished, methodologically, very good, but still they don't have any incentive to submit those articles to other to journals which is outside of India. So I think uh, one of the concrete steps that could be taken is by reaching out to the scholars in some of the good universities in, uh, in, um, in uh, global south uh, countries. And then I think diversifying the editorial board. And that's where there would be more awareness as Silvio made that the awareness should also become from, um, um, from within the country. So, so that scholars are aware that they have, so there are certain journals, certain good journals where they can try to publish so that the, there would be a global circulation of uh, academic knowledge. And then there would be some debates and discussions that will enrich the academic knowledge. So it will benefit. So, I'm, so what I'm trying to say here is that there should be some kind of concrete steps that could be taken to diversify the uh, knowledge production by bringing more diversities in the journal editorial board, reaching out to the scholars 
who are based in the global south and then trying to encourage them to get more and more submissions and that's the only way that you can make some concrete changes silvia did, uh, christian did you want to say something to that i christian you want to go first uh, you go ahead silvia I'll, I'll go second so i think that i mean Besides the fact that we identify all the structural inequalities, the question is understanding the system of incentives and rewards for many people to actually do this. Whether or not you're convinced that this matters or whether or not you have, you never thought about this question. So there are strong incentives for why people who never thought about this question will continue not to think about this question. And also because of power. The more diversified the field, the more power is distributed. And that is threatening. That is a problem. That is challenging. It's not just a question of sharing the space. So that's one issue. So there are a number of things that we can do, and many of us have been trying to do. Like, you know, to me, the principle is the following identify what the problem is and then figure out what the solution is. If the problem is funding, figure out where you can get funding, especially if you are based in a wealthier country with a wealthier higher education system, and bring in scholars who are in country who don't have that kind of access. Is the problem is writing in the conventional style that most um, Western-based journals accept, then work with somebody in trying to see how you write an article that is right for that journal, given what the journal typically publish. If the problem is that people are not connected to certain groups of scholars in the North, let's say in certain countries who work on certain theoretical issues, try to bridge, as Eugenia said, and figure out how you can connect people. So there are a number of things that we can do. Some are sort of low hanging fruits, things that we can do, including mentoring. And some things are much more challenging, again, because you run into power. You run into people who don't want to give an inch in making this a more sort of horizontal way of thinking about global academia. And people have no incentive, in, you know, no curiosity of thinking about we're living in global academia. We're not living in a time when academia is neatly bounded by geographical boundaries, right? And that to me is, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a challenge. Thank you. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say very briefly, you know, besides seconding everything that, that Silvia said, um, I, 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 I definitely take the point that uh, we can do more to broaden our editorial board, you know, thinking about the small things we can do. Um, sometimes I worry that uh, because of the structure of incentives uh, that, that Tabarez and others have described in the Global South, uh, you end up with a situation where the people who are, uh, you know, the few people in, in those communities that are interested in doing this kind of international work uh, end up being overworked because they are the only ones that editors can call up to to lead these, you know, internationalization efforts. You know, there was a, you know, it's it's similar with, you know, some, you know, and 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 when when you have a, you know, African Americans in the U.S. and, you know, they're they're now being involved in a lot of diversity initiatives, that adds to their workload. That means they have to do even more work to uh, reach goals that people in the majority uh, can reach much more easily. So. That is something that I sometimes am worry about. I very much believe in the idea of mentoring, and I, I really like the idea of Eugenia's idea of uh, you know bridges. Um, and actually, this is something that you know Silvio, I, and others have been discussing for a while, and uh, uh, it got a bit derailed by COVID and all the you know uncertainty of the last few months. Um, but this is something that, as as an editor, I want to do for the journal uh, to create some sort of uh, infrastructure whereby uh, if we receive articles uh, that are promising as well as solicited them uh, but are not written in the kind of language and in the kind of uh, with the kind of approach that would get through peer review to identify uh, someone uh, that can mentor these authors and, and help them achieve those goals. Uh, my concern in doing that you know is also um, not to sound paternalistic. That's something that I'm that I worry about sometimes that I think we are having two not parallel but simultaneous conversations here. One has to do with 
you know, how do we get, you know, good research from the global south that fits more or less with the paradigm of the global north published. Uh, and the other is how, you know, is a struggle for power. It's a struggle for power in the, in the production of knowledge. And uh, I, I think, you know, the solutions that work for one might not necessarily work for the other or might even, you know, go against the goals, of the, the, the latter goals. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very conscious of these, of these uh, you know, complexities. Thanks, that, that's very helpful. Tanya, I see you wanted to... Yeah, just to add to that, I think, um, Christian, you're absolutely right. And I think one way of getting around that um, concern around paternalism is that we don't always have to think about collaboration and mentorship as being a global north, global south collaboration. I think there are lots of possibilities for global south, global south um, collaborations. And I think you can begin with members of the editorial board or people that have published in the journal um, who are located in the global south or who are Global South scholars um, who can um, perform or do practice that kind of mentoring. So just, yeah, just a quick comment around that, that actually when we talk about that kind of mentoring, you're absolutely right not, not to get, you know, not, not to make it appear paternalistic. Um, and a great way to do that is actually to bring in um, those experienced Global South scholars who have published in this and similar journals um, to actually do that kind of mentoring. Thanks. I think we are kind of running out of time, but um, I just wanted to pick up a point that there is a very good point uh, from the from the chat and it speaks to, to this uh, mentoring as well. That is, I mean, we are kind of assuming and, and, and the, the first one guilty here, given that um, I kind of organize this, that the scholars in the global south want to publish in international journals, right? And that, and that somehow they should. Um, and this, you know, it speaks to the incentives. And I think it's true that there has to be, beyond the structural incentives of each country, um, it has to be a dialogue um, for, for that to happen. And also, I guess, in the more kind of inst instrumental part, it's also about what you get when you submit, right? Are you going to get a review that is going to help you to think um, about what you have done or, or not? A review that not only is going to be rude, but also is going to force you to think and change your paradigm because somehow that's the knowledge that is accepted. So I think a very good point out of this is and perhaps me based on the global notes and all the rest is not to make any assumptions about, you know, it's not just that people from the global south are not quite submitting enough or, 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 or hitting the, the excellent as defined by the global notes, but also that there has to be a, a mutual interest here. Um, for that to be uh, relevant uh, for, for both um, Global South and Global North. I don't know if that makes sense, but anyway. Um, Janet, should I pass it to you? Possibly. I think uh, it's been interesting because the panelists are also reading the chat and have really, I think, responded to most of the comments and questions. Um, one that I'd like to go back to that was, that's been raised by several people in the chat, and Tabarez talked about this a little bit. Um, this question, the, the question of to what extent are papers about the Global South only validating theory developed in and about the Global North? And, or are, are scholars from the Global South building new theory about the Global South? And when they do, it gets rejected by reviewers from the Global North because it doesn't, make, it doesn't conform to the paradigm of the Global North. That it, that's, what, that's the way that I interpreted what Tabara has said earlier, that he's, what, he wrote a paper that was sent to six reviewers because his findings just didn't conform with what the reviewers expected. And um, so I, I, think that, I think that's a really interesting issue. And um, obviously, I'm not from the Global South, but I've spent a lot of time in both Indonesia and Malaysia working with younger scholars. And I, and I find, I, I think there's also something in the supply here that, that there's an idea that a good research, you take some theory from the global north and then apply it to Indonesia or you apply it to Malaysia. And then either it works or it doesn't work. And then you've got this, usually it doesn't work, but then young scholars are not encouraged to say, well, why doesn't it work? Let's build our own theory. It's kind of like you've got to find, fit your findings into what the pre-existing scholarship does. And if you don't do that, then you know, your, your, your work isn't good. I would love to hear the panel address that. This, this thing about 
going back one step to supervising dissertations. And, and it seems like, at least in Indonesia, a standard topic is take some theory, the favorite is always Bob Entman, take something Bob Entman said about framing and then apply it to Indonesia. And so I wonder if, if we need to actually step, go back one step and say, well, all right, well, what even about topics, you know, the, the choice of topics? Can I just quickly intervene in that, um, Jen? I think that is so spot on, you know, because I think that, you know, our experience in the universities here, whether it be studying many, 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 many years ago or even uh, in, in our current situation, I think it's, um, it comes from, I, I suppose, one, also the, the unfortunate rejection also of some of the tra traditional knowledge and practices, right, that actually help us understand some of the political turbulences or, or changes and dynamics. And then we completely resort to something that's already been framed that becomes the source of the textbook for, for a lot of the uh, social sciences. Um, and so even in this region, we are not referring much to colleagues from around the region, right? And that's, that's so problematic because there's so much of work uh, being done. Although that's not really you know, the only situation, I think that's definitely changed. Um, uh, but I think there's a fear of not being able to complete that, I don't know, academic task um, and, and the fear of introducing new ideas, I think, within the institutions, because, you know, let's not talk about academic freedom in this part of the world. Also, that's another challenge. So I think that really uh, creates a, 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 another level of the kind of censorship of thought and ideas, but really to ignore actually a lot of traditional, and, and I don't mean traditional in a way that, um, uh, that it's just of a particular era, but just um, challenging notions or, or different ways of thinking about political experiences um, that don't get into the kind of scholarship as well. So I think, I, I mean, I just echo what you say, um, and, and indeed it's a challenge, but I think, I think that's slowly changing. I hope uh, that we're recognizing more work done by colleagues in the region uh, for our own, re our own references, yeah. Okay. Um, one thing, I, well, a couple of things I also wanted to pick up on is, yeah, uh, sorry, um, perhaps to have been picked up earlier, but of course the Global South is a huge generalization, right, and, and there's part, part of the, the, the mix of issues here have to do with that. But the other thing that um, a few of the people in the chat, I think, are uh, saying yes to mentorship and also asking some specific questions, you know, for instance, around translation, around submission, Etc. So perhaps moving quite a few gears down, you know, certainly very much um, downstream. But um, perhaps Christian, you can talk a little bit about that. And also, I think there is, from what I see here, a lot of appetite for this idea of, of um, mentoring, and, and it doesn't have to be uh, north to south at all. It can be you know south to north and south to south and whatever. Um, uh, but yeah, if you could perhaps talk a little bit about that, Christine, um, just to make sure that that, that is over as well. Uh, sure. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, language and writing, I mean, I've, you know, I've seen, you know, I, I will say that in general, uh, you know, you, you, you hardly get an article rejected or desk rejected in, in this journal, at least because the writing is not perfect. Uh, you, you, know, you, you will be told by reviewers or by the editor in some cases, you know, please proofread it, please have it looked over by a native speaker. And I understand that that is a, a, a burden, right? If, if people don't have access to that, um, you know, there are people in some countries that can pay a translator or, a, or you know, a proofreader and, and others that, that can't. Uh, but obviously we, you know, I, you know the, but, but uh, what I wanted to say is that an article will usually not get rejected because of that. Obviously, you know, we are all humans and reviewers are humans. So if, if a reviewer is having a hard time reading through an article and, uh, you know, that, that, you know, that might affect their judgment of the contribution of the article, um, just in the same way as, you know, when we read the uh, drafts uh, from other people, you know, if the writing is not clear, then it obscures our ability to, to gather the content. But I would say that in, in most cases, probably because of the nature of the journal, you know, this is not 
the reason why an article would not be accepted. I think there is a bigger problem, and that is, um, you know, what, what Janet was talking about, which is, and you know, again, I think about myself, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, you know, I would, you know, read all these volumes of amazing political communication literature produced in the U.S., and then I would look at Italy, and it was like, hmm, this is not a two-party system. This is not a presidential system. The media here are mostly not commercial. Uh, or if they are commercial, they're not middle of the road objective in the way that American media were until, you know, well, most American media still are. Um, and this is not a world power. So these things are quite different and make it quite difficult to adapt uh, these theories to the Italian context that I was studying at the time. And I think we need to do a lot more about that. Um, I posted in the chat earlier a contribution by Sebastian Valenzuela and Hernando Rojas, uh, who made a lot of points that have been echoed here, uh, saying basically everyone who publishes, who, who uh, writes in our articles about researching a country should reflect on how those findings are affected by context and how they might generalize. And that applies to especially those who write from countries that are better represented and more, more commonly written about, starting from the US. Um, and based on that you know, insight, you know, we changed uh, a little bit of our editorial guidelines and our editorial guidelines now say uh, that every article should specify right from the start where the analysis was conducted and, and at least at some point towards, you know, in, in the article should reflect on how the particular context of that country should, uh, might have affected the results in their generalizability. And that was not meant, and I hope it's not understood as, you know, what Patricia Rossini was saying in the chat, you know, uh, uh, people from Brazil get asked to justify why study Brazil or what Nayaz was saying, you know, uh, people who have research from India are, you know, set, the bar is set higher for them because, you know, a lot of people don't care about India. That is meant as a, an encouragement. And, you know, if they don't accept the encouragement, we enforce that to colleagues from, you know, countries that have, you know, a lot of research and a lot of theory derived from them to still think about how is this particular piece of research uh, linked to the specific context I've been studying? Um, and by the way, you know, in, in, you know, I've, you know, we, we've never set numbers of reviewers based on where the study comes from. Um, and you know, I, I, six reviewers seems seems quite a lot, uh, and it's never happened, uh, at, at least under my watch at the journal, and I'm sure uh, uh, hardly ever. Um, but you know, I think I think that that would be rather unfair. Uh, I think sometimes you need more reviewers when the methodology is very complex or it's a mixed method study and you need more perspectives, uh, but that, that, that would seem absolutely not, uh, not, not fair. Um, I, there was one other question that's come up in various forms in the chat. And I think it's sort of, um, I'll, I'll put a, even a sharper point on it, which is, is this entire conversation reinforcing the hegemony of the global north? Like, yeah, we've got the standard and we're trying really hard to make sure everybody can, can you know, meet our standard and we'll do what we can to help you meet our standard. That, that maybe the, this, this, the, the thrust of the entire conversation is reinforcing the hegemony of the global north. I've seen about five or six comments along those lines. Like, why should you want to publish in a Western journal? What's even the point? Can I speak? That's, that's a, a great question. Um, and I know a number of people based outside of, of the West who are not interested because their academic culture, the way of thinking about several issues are completely different from what they believe is in the West, or because they tried and uh, they were rejected especially because they offer a perspective or a sort of a way of writing, a way of thinking completely different from the so-called mainstream on both sides of the North Atlantic. So, um, and, that's, and that's fine because there is no single model that, and there should not be a single model of what uh, quality scholarship should be. But it's also an opportunity to, to fight that fight in the journals that are originally based in the West and sort of, let's say, have a global readership or a global scope. I think it's important to fight that fight about counter hegemonic way of thinking about paradigms and findings and scholarship and epistemology, not only in your country and your region, but that should be a global fight. Um, so 
Although I respect and I actually have many good friends who said like, I have zero interest in, in talking to those people or getting published by those people, really. I, I, we don't see it eye to eye. And that's perfectly legitimate, of course. But on the other hand, I think for those who say, well, that's an interesting challenge. Why don't we try to basically reframe the way that people think about so-called traveling theories or traveling findings or paradigms or anything else? Some people say, I don't want to fight that fight. And that's perfectly fine. It's not about conforming with a single paradigm. It's actually how do we mobilize networks to actually fight that fight, right? So if the work that I've tried to do, you know, with scholars in, in, in different countries, it's not about, well, if you want to be successful, you need to publish in these journals and conform to what the expectations are in terms of, you know, sections and, you know, who you cite, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's about the work that you do, what you believe is important, and try to see if you're interested in having an audience in an English language journal that has more of a global readership, so on and so forth. So, Can I just make a very quick point? Um, I think the pressure for publication and, and that kind of recognition is so real for every academic. Um, and I think that one of the fights that may not be such, uh, you know, uh, that's much closer to I think everyone's experience is also, I suppose in a way redefining what would then be acceptable for the institutions. Because I think there is a move maybe to also expand the kind of, uh, um, you know, what would be, reasonable expectations of scholars, what they produce, their outputs um, that do not need to meet, um, you know, some of these traditional indicators that have been there for years, uh, primarily led by the sciences, um, as I understand. So I think bringing in some of the more, um, uh, more nuanced, um, you know, impact of one's output, I think into that whole scholarly uh, recognition might be a fight that I, I suppose we can all take um, you know, for us, um, you know, having the kind of public output is as important as having a publication in a journal because we want to communicate uh, some of these ideas to the public because we want to see the change happening there. And that I think is a really good step uh, to take. So, you know, um, there, I suppose there are different fights uh, that can be all considered also because I think redefining what, um, you know, sets the parameters, I think, for that kind of uh, scholarly recognition uh, you know, has to also be in the mix, I think, yeah. I, I think we are just about out of time. Um, one, to, to add on to something that was said earlier, I think sometimes universities in the Global South, like in the Global North, have key performance indicators for faculty, and one of those indicators is publishing in international journals. So I think, you know, the who wants to be in your journal anyway question may not really be relevant for a lot of people in the Global South, because, you know, if, you, if you're planning on getting tenure, you have to publish in international journals. We are just about out of time. Um, are there, do, does anybody on the panel have a final thing they're dying to say? You know, your, 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 your important parting words here? I'd like to thank everyone, everyone who participated and everyone in the comments. I, I, I know we didn't get to answer to all, all questions and comments, but I think it's important to have, uh, why publish in the North is I don't, I can't read, uh, I don't know, Hindi, and I can't read Malaysian. But I can read English, and, and, and it's great to learn about research from other countries. And, and I can't do it in Hindi, I'm probably, and I can't do it in Mandarin either, but I can do it in English. So I think one reason is to actually be able to talk among ourselves. Well, it is now 9.30, at least in the US, so I think we need to move on to the next panel. I apologize if I didn't get your question, but please, uh, they're still in the chat, and so maybe um, you can have a look at the chat, the panelists, and um, apologies. And thanks to everyone, this was terrific. Thanks so much for Anna and Christian for organizing this, and to our great panelists for participating, and to all of the great audience members who wrote terrific questions and comments. <laughs>